So our Bible reading for today will be Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 to chapter 21, verse 17. Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 to chapter 21, verse 17. It says this. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered. He wants our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. As they approached Jerusalem and came to the breadfish on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with their colts by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on their own colt, the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling them. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a cold, a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, James. Uh Uh-oh, I'm not wrong. Okay. Thanks, Sean, and thanks, James, and hi, everyone. It's great to see you and great to be with you tonight. And uh, we're continuing continuing tonight to think about why would anyone follow Jesus at uni. And we started this last week. We were thinking of reading Matthew's Gospel. And uh, if you weren't here then, I will will try to catch you up a little bit as we go on tonight. And um, you should be able to pick it up okay. But we're really diving into the middle of Matthew's story about Jesus. In fact towards the end of Matthew's account of Jesus' earthly life. And here, uh, Jesus is arriving at Jerusalem. So he's been, he's been on his way to Jerusalem, and now he arrives there. And we're going to see three incidents that happen there. And as we think about it, uh, we're going to be thinking about why would you follow Jesus? And what, well, first of all, what do we mean when we talk about following someone? What would it mean to follow Jesus? Um, These days, in the era of social media, actually following someone probably doesn't mean that much. You can follow someone who you just find interesting. Um, Maybe some of you are followers, say, of Donald Trump or, I don't know, just someone who who you think that person is interesting and maybe you just want to keep up with what they're doing, but you have no interest in actually being devoted to them in any way, maybe? Something like that? I don't know. But here we're talking about something more serious than just clicking 
uh, on someone and saying you want to follow them, want to hear from them, but actually uh, taking the step to devote yourself to them, to listen to them obediently, to pattern your life on them. For Jesus' followers, it meant treating him as their teacher and learning from him and traveling around with him and devoting themselves to him. That's the kind of following that we're talking about here, being a sort of mega fan, being an ultra fan of Jesus. And you may think, well, look, is it really wise to follow anyone in that way? Does it really make sense to follow anyone at all? Because our experience of leaders uh, generally in the world has been that leaders manipulate their followers, that they exploit their followers, they're so cynical really about their followers that it might be better not to have any or follow any leaders at all just to keep your distance uh, so that you won't get hurt. Uh, and as one poet said, the poet Bob Dylan, Nobel Prize winning poet, don't follow leaders. That was not a particularly poetic moment, but don't follow leaders. That's fairly straight. And, so it makes me think, hold on, if someone tells me to not follow leaders, then maybe I should follow leaders. I should disobey that. I don't know. What do you think? Is it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, one of the problems is, of course, if you don't follow leaders, then who are you actually going to end up following? Uh, you might say, well, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to follow anyone. I'm just going to be myself. But most people find this really hard to do, they end up following the crowd, being part of the mob, following the mob. And what does the mob do? The mob buys all the toilet paper. <laughs> That's the kind of thing mobs do. That's the kind of thing crowds do. The leaders say, don't panic, don't panic buy, but the mob does exactly the opposite. It's not clear that following the mob is any better than following leaders. Well, what I want to do is just to look in more detail at Jesus and think, well, is it worth following? Is it worth following him? Why would anyone actually take that step of being a follower of Jesus in that devoted way? So we're going to look at three incidents that happen here uh, as Jesus arrives at Jerusalem. One before, one as he arrives and one after he arrives. I'm sorry we don't have any handouts today, uh, but if you would like to follow, I think the, the, the passage will come up on the screen again. But if you've got a Bible or a device that, where you can get a Bible on it, that might be best to follow along there. And you know, if you've got your phone out, you can quickly glance at whoever you follow on Facebook. Well, you know, if, I, if the talk gets boring. So it's, <laughs> today you can have devices out and it's fine. Um, and it'd be great to follow along here in Matthew chapter, starting at Matthew chapter 20, verse 29. And first of all, Jesus uh, is in the town of Jericho, uh, leaving the town of Jericho, and it says, A loud, large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard Jesus was passing by, shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Uh, these people are beggars. Apparently they come from Jericho. They're not traveling along with Jesus. And they're crying out the thing um, that beggars apparently called out in ancient Israel, which is, have mercy on us or have mercy on me. They're calling out to Jesus. The crowd tell them to be quiet. You guys, quiet down, shut up. Uh, but it says that they actually called out even more loudly, called out all the more, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And so Jesus stops and he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Now, this is interesting because uh, Jesus gives them the opportunity to ask for whatever they want. And maybe they might have asked what they would normally have asked, and that is, can you give me some money? Give us, please give us some money. But they're calling out to Jesus and they, they really see that this is their chance. This is their, they're not going to shut up, they're not going to be quiet. This is their chance. 
and they're going to go for the big one. They ask for their their sight back. We want to see. They say. And Jesus, it says, had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and they received their sight. This word compassion is the word for uh, what you feel in your guts. In your guts, Jesus felt in his guts that he wanted to help them. Now, I don't know if you know this expression, but sometimes around our family, we say this thing to each other, love your guts. Do you ever, this is just a weird Australian thing to say, love your, love your guts. And uh, the other day I was uh, walking down the street and I saw a, a delivery van came past. And you know, sometimes you think, only my family talks in this way, like we're the only ones. But the van on the side of it said, love your guts. And I thought, oh, that, that's interesting. I wonder what that's about. And I looked more closely. It turns out it's one of those drinks that, you know, puts bacteria in your stomach or something. Yeah. So you meant to love your own guts. By... So, but Jesus doesn't say love your guts. He said, but what he does, he loves them in his guts. Right? He, he sees them and he has compassion. He feels it right down here. Okay, so we're meant to we see Jesus really looks at them. He really cares about them, cares about their situation, sees the pathetic situation that they're in, and so he heals them. Second thing that happens is that Jesus then arrives uh, close to Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives, and Jerusalem is on a hill, and another, the hill next door to it is the Mount of Olives. So Jesus here is preparing to go into the city. He's going to go down in the valley and then up the hill to Jerusalem, which is a city on a hill. And uh, what he does is he arranges to, uh, for the, some of his followers to go and collect some donkeys. And uh, he's going to ride those donkeys into the city. It's a deliberate choice that Jesus makes to go into the city in this way. And Matthew tells us this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is deliberately doing something here that fulfills the, a prophecy that came from a long time before. Israel's prophet spoke of the king that was going to come in the future. And Zechariah, one of the prophets, uh, particularly said this thing, that the king is going to come riding on a donkey. That is, not on a war horse to come as a conqueror, but in a humble, gentle way, riding on a donkey, uh, which is a donkey, uh, you know, is maybe a smelly and stubborn animal, but it's not going to scare anyone, I, probably, I don't think. Uh, it's, it's not an aggressive move that Jesus is making here. It's a humble, gentle, he's coming Yes, as a king, but in a gentle way. And uh, so Jesus is riding on the donkey and the crowds are getting very excited. Now what's going on here is that Jerusalem was a, a centre of pilgrimage, still is today, of course. Um, and when there was a major festival on, like the Passover, which was just about to happen, thousands and thousands of people would come from all over Israel, in fact, all over the ancient world, Mediterranean world, to come to the festival. And the population of Jerusalem would swell several times over. So it's actually not a very big city, and not with a large population normally, but during the festival times, uh, tens or sometimes hundreds of thousands of people would come. And they'd be crammed in there in the city. And so you can imagine, at this time, just before the, the festival is about to start, all these people, all these pilgrims are journeying towards Jerusalem and walking on the road up to the city. And so Jesus is not alone. Lots and lots of people are coming as well, and they're excited that Jesus is coming, and it becomes a, this sort of big parade. And the people uh, get excited, and some of them take off their cloaks and put them down on the road. Uh, and other people cut down branches from trees and put them down on the road. What are they doing here? Well, they're kind of, you've got to imagine this is a bit, it's a very dusty road. There's no paved roads. And so any crowd of people uh, and donkeys and people walking along, a huge amount of dust gets kicked up. And what are they doing? They're kind of saying, I don't want any dust to get on Jesus. 
He's so special. I will take off my own garment, my own piece of clothing, and I'll put it on the road, and I will let the donkey tread on it, rather than any of the dust getting on. Even the donkey that Jesus is riding, I don't want it, I don't want it to get dusty. That's how special Jesus I I'm willing to sacrifice my own piece of clothing for that. That's how much I care. That's how much I how special I think Jesus is. Um, and when you think about it, it's it's a pretty uh, big gesture to actually take off a piece of your clothing and let someone else let an animal walk on it. Or let, even to let someone walk on it. Uh, I don't know if any of you had this idea last week, you know, when it was raining and you, you had an opportunity. Uh, maybe there was someone special on campus and you, you, and you wanted to make a gesture of your affection towards them, towards that person. And you saw them stepping out of the building during the rain and you, you took off your jacket or your raincoat and you, and you just put it down in front of them and you say, you know, I care about you so much. I, I don't even want your feet to touch that water. I don't, want you, I don't want your socks getting damp. That's how much I care about you. Did any of you do that? You missed, you missed a big opportunity because that would, that would be a profound gesture, wouldn't it? That would really be saying something about how you felt about them. So that's what they're doing. They're getting into it. It's a big parade, putting their cloaks on the road, uh, putting branches on the road, and they start shouting and singing as uh, Jesus is going up there. And they would normally have been singing. There was there were psalms. There are songs in the Bible which are pilgrim songs for people to sing on the way up there. So they're praising God. But they start to say specific things about Jesus. Hosanna to the Son of David. This word Hosanna is uh, a kind of prayer. It means save us. And uh, they may be saying save us to Jesus or to God. Or, but it seems that the word was also just used as a way of praising God. You are the saviour. You can save us. Uh, We think that's how great you are. They say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Praise God for what's going on here. So they're very excited. People in the city then want to know what's going on. As the pilgrims all come in, uh, what are you guys going on about? And they say, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And then we hear about the third incident. Jesus goes to the temple at the centre of the whole reason that Jerusalem was this place of pilgrimage was because the temple was there. And at the temple, people could meet with God. Jesus goes into the temple courts and it says, he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. So the temple courts have all these people in them and they've set up a kind of market in there. And presumably the religious authorities have agreed to this. What are they doing there? Well, first of all, they're selling animals for sacrifice. The idea was really that you were meant to bring your own animals. But here they've kind of made it more convenient. You just bring cash and you can buy an animal at the place. It's like 7-Eleven religion here. You know, you've, we, we've just got, it's convenience. And there are money changes there. So what they decided was, uh, we can't have people giving, you know, Roman and Greek coins uh, to the temple because they've got, you know, pagan symbols on them and pagan gods and stuff on them. So we will need to change, they'll need to change those coins for our special religious coins. And, you know, you can make make a bit of money on on doing that. Uh, The exchange rate. Uh, You have to buy the special religious coins. And Jesus just clears them out of there. Uh, He he won't let them continue to do this. He drives them out. uh, And to justify what he's doing, he quotes again from the prophets. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it. A den of robbers. Uh, and uh, the people who are the religious authorities there, the scribes, sorry, the teachers of the law and the chief priests want to know what is going on here. In particular, they're offended by children running around the temple. And you can imagine this is everyone is, is having a great time, getting really excited because Jesus is there. The children are running around calling out, 
Hosanna to the son of David. And the, these people are angry that the children are doing this. Don't you hear what they're saying, they ask him. Uh, and Jesus says, yes, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. Quoting from David's uh, psalm, psalm number eight, saying, actually, you know, this is pretty much God's normal way of doing things. Most people, the normal people, uh, the leaders, these leaders don't know what's going on here, but the kids, they get it. And they're the ones that God uses to praise him. Okay, so you've got the three incidents. You've got Jesus showing mercy to the two blind men. You've got Jesus on the donkey riding into Jerusalem. You've got Jesus clearing out the temple here. Uh, what I want you to do is talk to the person next to you and you need to look at the passage. What links up these three passages? What connects them together? So have a look at it with the person next to you and just see if you, what kind of connections you can see between these three stories. Take a minute to do that. Okay. Thank you very much for doing that. Did you discover any connections, any theme, any words that connect these three Jesus. incidents for you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone, can anyone elaborate? Say a bit more. Um, Jesus is called the son of David in all three stories. Jesus called the son of David in all three stories. Did it, anyone else get that? Okay, what other kinds of things? Is there anything else that... In the, um, at least in the first and the last one, actually there's all of them, there's sort of the thing, people in humble circumstances praising Jesus. Yes. So you've got like the blind man and the children. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's, it's a bit of a sandwich. There's some parallels between the, the first and the third. Yeah, like the healing of the blind and the, yeah, those kinds of things. It's sort of like a demonstration of Jesus' authority, like his authority to heal, and then other people acknowledging that on the path, and then his authority to, you know, drop people out of his house. Yeah. Yes, okay, so different kinds of authority on display. Um, and even in the, you know, the story about the donkey, it's, it's an act of humility, but he's telling them this is what's going to, you know, just go and say, we need it. The Lord needs it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's really interesting that in each one, uh, Jesus is referred to as the son of David. And this is not a common way of referring to Jesus in the Bible or in the New Testament, uh, and, or even in the book of Matthew, it's just there, it's there a few times, but here it's three times in three stories. So I think we're meant to notice that. We're really meant to notice at this point. That's right. And what, is it, what does it mean to call Jesus the son of David? Well, the story has been showing us that actually Jesus grew up with uh, Joseph as his father. So where does this all come from? What's going on here? Uh, but of course David was the great king of Israel he was the saviour king he was the messiah, the first messiah and so to call Jesus the son of David is to say that Jesus is a new and better David that Jesus is going to be like David the great king, the great saviour king a special king, God's own king in other words, the leader that God wants us to follow. That Jesus is the leader that God has appointed for his people to follow. But I just want you to notice what kind of king Jesus is re revealed to be here by these stories. In the first story, the healing of these blind men. Jesus is shown to be compassionate. He's shown, shown to care about them in his guts. Sees their situation. And he wants to help them. And this is important. That if we're going to follow a leader, it, let it be a compassionate leader. 
A leader could be powerful but not care about us, not care for us. But we need that kind of compassion. Uh, Jesus, in his compassion, cares about us and our situation and has the power to do something about it. He looks at our situation and he will do what what we need uh, in order to be helped. And this includes the things that we most need help with, that we need forgiveness for our sins and ultimately we need new life, we need resurrection in the face of death, that Jesus will look on us in compassion because of our need for these things. In the second story we see that Jesus is a gentle king and uh, this word is used of Jesus several times in the Bible. Jesus, in fact, used it of himself back in chapter 11 of Matthew. He said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need a king, we need a leader who will treat us gently, who knows our weaknesses and won't burden us more than we can bear. And Jesus promises to do that, promises to give rest to us. He's gentle with his followers. And the third thing to notice from the third story is that Jesus is just, that he's a righteous king. What's going on there is Jesus clears out the temple. Well, remember that for those people, the people of Israel, the temple was really at the centre of the world. It was at the centre of the world. It was a place uh, where heaven and earth touched. It was a place where you could meet with God. And so the temple is at the very centre of their thinking about the world. And so Jesus is coming to the very middle of things, coming to the very centre of things and starting to put things right. You see that? Clearing out those who are exploiting the temple, making it something that it should not be, and he's making it right. So just for a moment in time, the very centre of the world, centre of the universe, has been set right. Jesus is symbolically beginning his project of making all things right. Making all things right. And so it's not just that Jesus cares, not just that Jesus is compassionate and merciful, but that he has a program to put all things right. He is just. He's righteous. And when, I think when you put these things together, you see that you, you have a king, you have a leader worth following. Compassionate, gentle, and just. And seeing these things together helps us not to construe Jesus compassion and gentleness as weakness. You see what I mean? He's not a wimp. He's not a pushover. Uh, actually, he gets things done uh, in a way that we, we find hard to combine those things. But he does things. He gets things done. He brings the right situation, but he does it with gentleness and compassion. Why follow Jesus? Because he is a gentle, compassionate and just king. But also he calls his followers to be like him. To be like him. To learn to be gentle and compassionate and just the way he is. And I think sometimes people worry about, if I follow Jesus, will it mean following lots of rules? Will I be trapped by a system of rules or something like that? Well, maybe there are rules there, but really what you'd be doing in following Jesus is saying, I want to be like him. The ethical project, the ethical challenge of Christianity, if you like, is really about becoming like Jesus. And that actually is a challenge that's good for you and good for me. I don't know if you think in this way, but uh, I, I would love to be a good person. I would love to be a good person. 
I know how far I am away from that. And following Jesus means a commitment and a hope to become like Jesus in time. That the ultimate thing that I, that I hope for myself is to be like him. Compassionate, gentle and just. And actually this is a good, this is a good thing. This is something worth hoping for, something worth seeking out. That Jesus himself is worth following because he's so good. He's also worth following because if you follow him, his commitment is that you become like him. Well, just to finish up, I want to think about a couple of images from the story here. And first of all, just to go back to those cloaks on the road. Uh, those, those people putting their cloaks down and putting the branches down are making a beautiful gesture towards Jesus. I don't want any dust to get on you. I think you're so great. And Jesus accepts that for that moment. It's appropriate. He really is the king. He really is the son of David. And it's appropriate that he comes into Jerusalem in that way and be celebrated in that way. But it really is just a moment. Jesus is not going to actually let other people serve him in that way that protects him from the dirt. And actually we see it in the story where he goes to the blind man and he actually touches their eyes. Did you notice that? I don't know what their blind eyes were like, but I can't imagine it was very nice. But Jesus gets right in there and touches them. And in only a few days' time in Matthew's story, Jesus is going to be arrested and beaten and crucified. He's not going to avoid the dirt of this world. Jesus coming into the world was a commitment to get into the, the worst of human life. And Jesus does not let other people keep him away from the dirt, the way most leaders and most kings do. You can bet there are a lot of very safely quarantined leaders in the world at the moment. But Jesus doesn't do that. He gets right into it, right into the dirt and blood and sweat. And last week we saw, we heard uh, the way Jesus explained it, that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That what Jesus is doing is entering into our human existence in order to serve us. And that serving ends up being a dirty and bloody business that Jesus does on our behalf and for our sake. Why is it worth following him? Actually, because he, he didn't let people just put their cloaks on the road for him the whole way, but he went and served us in the way that he lived and died. Second picture from the story is the picture of the blind men. And uh, throughout the story of the church and Christian history, people have seen this story of the blind men as kind of a paradigm uh, of every, every person's potential spiritual experience with Jesus. Uh, that the blindness, the physical blindness that they suffer is in some ways symbolic of a spiritual blindness that afflicts humanity generally. And when, and when Jesus helps us to see, takes away the darkness, takes away the blindness, the spiritual blindness, then we're able to see the truth about him and able to, like this, the men in the story, follow him. Having been cured of their blindness, they follow Jesus. And uh, I think, you know, without getting too sort of allegorical about it, I think actually that's a helpful way of interpreting the story for yourself. That uh, Jesus takes away spiritual blindness uh, so that people can follow him. Uh, one uh, gospel song is called I Saw the Light. Do you know this song? It's a, it's a country and western gospel song. So it's like the, the, the wackiest um, 
cheesiest kind, but it's a great song actually by Hank Williams. And uh, this is what it says. The second verse goes like this. Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. But then like the blind man that God gave back his sight, praise the Lord, I saw the light. And the chorus says, I saw the light, I saw the light. <laughs> no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy. Now I'm so happy. No sorrows in sight. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Uh, and, well, you might say it's a little bit cheesy and no more sorrows is probably a bit of an exaggeration. But that's the kind of, uh, I think that's the kind of experience that lots of people have had. That they found it hard to kind of get it. And it, it, it took uh, God's miraculous work in their life, the work of the Holy Spirit, to help them see. And once they are able to see, then they are able to follow Jesus. Take that step. So I'm not quite sure where you're up to, but it could be that there are different kinds of prayers you might pray at the moment. It might be that you're still feeling like you're kind of blind, you're still trying to get it. And the request of the blind man might be a good prayer for you as well. Lord, I want to see. Lord, I want to see. Or it could be that you uh, now feel like you are seeing. You're really actually getting it and you're saying, yes, I do want to follow Jesus. And I think maybe for you, the image of placing a cloak, your clothes down before, your, your, your outer garment down before him might be a good image to think of to say, that's how highly I now think of Jesus. I, I would hate for him to get a speck of dust on him. That's how devoted I am. To Jesus now. Or it might be that you've been following Jesus for a long time and you just want to say Hosanna to the son of David. You see how great a king he is and you just want to praise him. Well I might uh, pray variations on that prayer for all of us now so why don't we pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for sending Jesus, your son, and we thank you that he did not come to be served, but to serve, to get into the dirt and sweat and blood of our human lives, that he laid down his life as a ransom for me. Thank you so much. We want to pray for those here who are searching for you and trying to find you. And we pray that you would please... Give them their sight. Please help them to see the truth about Jesus. Pray for those who now want to take the step of faith. Now want to lay their cloaks down in front of Jesus. And we pray that you would help them to take that step. They would be able to say yes to becoming followers of Jesus. And for those who have been following for a long time, we say Hosanna. We say Thank you. We praise you that you are the God who saves and that you sent your son. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.